أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم المسلمين على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ورضي الله تعالى عن سادة التابعين وعلماء العاملين وأئمة الأربعة المجتهدين ومقلدهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wana alhamdulillah. How are you all doing? Alhamdulillah on Thursday we finished the book Umdatul Bayan written by Sheikh Uthman Ibn Muhammad more famously known as Uthman and Fodio. May Allah envelop him in his mercy. Ameen. That is the book dealing with the individual ob- obligations in the areas of Akida, Fiqh, and Tasawwuf or Sufism. Alhamdulillah. And so now we're going to. I say take a break, but switch subjects. And we're going to do a deep dive, a deep dive on the life of an important, important person in a not so distant past. This person actually lived during the same time as the Shehu. But unlike the Shehu, who was not only a scholar, but a ruler, this person was captured and enslaved 
and ended up here in the United States of America as a slave. And his name is Umar Ibn Said. And to examine his life, we're going to be using this book right here. Writing His Way to Spiritual Freedom, The Life and Works of Umar Ibn Said by Muhammad Abdullah Al-Ahari. Alhamdulillah. If any of you would like to purchase your copy of the book, go to our website, www.nurulzamaninstitute.org. Let me type that for you. Well, Samira trying to beat me to the punch. She and I are both typing it at the same time. She posted or typed in this specific link where you can click right on it and purchase it. Alhamdulillah. So this is the book we'll be using until we complete it, inshallah. This person is very, very, very important. He's one of those Africans who were, were enslaved and we happen to know something about him. Some details. And there's several of them that we know about. And you know, most of them were from the ones we know about, were from the Senegal, Gambia area. Now, during a time of slavery here, there were no such thing as Gambia and Senegal. There was no such thing as Gambia and Senegal. Those are modern nation states that came into being in the 18, late, 18, late 1800s, some of these countries in the 1900s, less than 100 years ago. Actually, I want to find a quote. Hold on for a second. Samira, Salaam Alaikum. Wa alaikum salam or tonight, big captain. How you doing? I'm good. Where Papa back? I hear you, Sasa. Hold on, I'm looking for something. While I'm looking, can you greet our class for me? Yes, I can do that. Let's see who's in the building. Wa alaikum salam to Labi Katu, Imamu, Abdubar, Sister Fatima, Brother Hakeem, Sister Jackie, Gigi in the building, um, Abdullah. 
uh, Miriam, uh, who else? Rashid and Nathaniel. Thank you for joining us today. Wale from the Wild Celebrity Captain. I'm delighted. That's all the time I needed. I was looking for a quote from this book right here The Black Book, The True Political Philosophy of Malcolm X, Al Hajman and Chabaz by Dr. Yusuf Naeem Klai. On page 33, uh, Yusuf Naeem Klai, Wyan Klai, he was uh, the leader of the Canadian branch of the OAAU, Organization of African American Unity, the, one of the organizations that Malcolm started before he passed. And for a long time, he used to go uh, and attend Malcolm's lectures and ask and ask him various different questions. And he formula and he put a lot of the questions that he used to ask him in a book. And this is he wrote several books, but this is one of the books. And so, uh, one of these questions and answers is. Does anyone know where the enslaved Africans came from in Africa? His response, the, yes, the African states as defined today are not the same as they were during the pre-colonial era. There were pre-colonial empires, not nation states. Thus, both German and French anthropologists have determined that the vast majority of Africans sent to the United States came from areas that were once included in the Ghana, Mali, and Songhai empires of Africa. And if you remember the last time we did a series of black lessons and we were coming from this book, we talked about each and every one of those empires because he talks about them in this book right here, uh, Mustafa Briggs talks about them in this book right here. And if you remember, when we covered those empires, many of those empires, they existed at the same time. Some they existed at the same time and they, one empire took over another empire. And so there's a lot of overlap, but many of those empires were, uh, inclusive of what is now called Gambia and Senegal. And I mentioned that today because when we do our tours, like we just did our first one, Alhamdulillah, and it was a success. When we do our tours to Senegal and Gambia, you should recognize and bear in mind that Yes, these places are now, you know, part of the modern nation state, but they were once kingdoms, Muslim and kingdoms and empires. And so when you, uh, when we visit Gambia and Senegal, you are seeing the remnants of the Ghana, Mali, and the Songhai Empire. So that's a plug for our next tour coming up in late November, early December. If you intend on going with us, uh, you gonna need to hold your spot before August 15th, which is in about 20 days, inshallah. So alhamdulillah, Umar ibn Said is not an exception to that. He was from that same area. But uh, we're going to get into it, inshallah. So, uh, Samira, can you go to page number five, the author's forward? Samira, Samira, Samira. I'm here. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, bismillahi rahmani rahim Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sabbihi wa salama taslima. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa 
wassalamu ala I'm about in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. I seek refuge in Allah from the rejected shaitan. May Allah bless our master, Sayyidina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, companions, and give them peace. All praise is due to Allah, for he is sufficient for us. Peace be upon his slaves whom he has chosen. As to what follows, assalamu alaikum, till I be careful to everyone. And wa alaikum assalam wa till I be careful to everyone that has given the greetings. On page five of the written, uh, riding his way to spiritual freedom, the life and works of Omar ibn Sayyid, rahimullah, by Muhammad Abdullah al-Ahari, and the original author, Omar ibn Sayyid. Author's foreword. This collection of the writings of Omar ibn Sayyid started when I wrote several articles for Minaret magazine about Islam in America in the late 1980s. Later, I did some work with Alan D. Austin on the second edition of his African Muslims in Antebellum America, where I was able to retranslate several texts in his book and find five additional manuscripts. Meeting Tariq Beard, the collector of African-American memorabilia who bought Omar's autobiography and related papers Theodore Dwight had collected and speaking on a panel with him along with several other scholars at DuSable Museum in Chicago about Omar and his text was the next step. Reading articles that downplayed Omar as a scholar or claimed he was a Christian made me finally decide to collect and translate his works. In 1993, Margaret Press printed a 40 page, eight and a half by 11 booklet that had two translations of his autobiography, a two page long essay about his other writings and a slightly shorter version of the first essay in this text, The Life of Omar Ibn Said, Rahimullah. Two years ago, Maghrebin Press published the third expanded edition of my work on Bilali Muhammad of Sapelo Island, Georgia, who wrote a 13 pages long work on the fiqh of prayer according to the Maliki Medab, an Islamic belief from the Ashari school of Akida. Stop right there. You know we got to put a pin in that right there. So the author of this uh, th this book right now, whose words we are reading, alhamdulillah, he's a white American. He's my friend on Facebook, and he's commented and chimed in uh, on our classes on more than one occasion, right? He is, you know, subhanAllah, he's doing a lot of work. And... Uh, we, he mentioned, you know, we're reading about Umar ibn Said. He, he mentioned uh, Bilali Muhammad of the Sapelo Island of Georgia. And we talked about him briefly. At some point, we're going to go a little bit deeper like we're doing with Umar ibn Said, inshallah, right? And, but what he's referring to, um, uh, Bilali Muhammad of Sapelo Island, Georgia, he wrote, from memory, portions of the Risala of Ibn Abi Zaid, al Qairawani, which we know when it was written, the book was intended for children, but it's more, it's used more like uh, lower or intermediate level thick uh, text. But the text, if you if you uh, study Maliki Fiqh and you're familiar with the book, you know that the book is more than just Fiqh. The first section of it really can be a standalone Akita book. It can be a complete Akita book by itself, a basic Akita text, right? Uh, and so he says, the fiqh of prayer according to the Maliki method and Islamic belief from the Ashari school of Akita. And so we have to, I said we have to put a pin in this, and remember this because just because we're not used to hearing certain terminologies when we hear it for the first time, or it seemed like, oh, I've been Muslim 20, 30 years, 
I never heard of this Asherik thing. Why am I hearing so much about it now? You're hearing so much about it now, it's because you've been cut off from your tradition. And just like we studied Umdatu Bayan by the Shehu, the introduction or the beginning, the first third of that book is dealing with Akita, classic Ashari Akita, West African scholar, right? The Risala of Ibn Abi Zaid, Maliki Fiqh, well, a staple in African scholarship, classical Ashari Akita in the Risala of Ibn Abi Zaid. And so when you and we look at the traditions, the culture, the way of life that was snatched away from the Africans who was forced into slavery. Don't just like generally think, oh yeah, Islam was snatched away from them. Yes, Islam was snatched away from them. But also what brand of Islam was snatched away from them? Most of them, Maliki Fik, Ashari Akita, and the various Turuk of the Sufiya. The Sufi Tariqas, right? So sometimes we can be general, but sometimes we need to be specific. So when you're talking about your tradition and your culture that was taken from you, that was, was taken from you. The Maliki Methab was taken from you. Not only did they, they took Islam away from you in general, they took it away from us, our ancestors, period. But what did that Islam look like? And these books and these writings and these uh, people who uh, we are blessed to have some of their lives preserved for us, you're going to see that it was consistent of the Islam that they brought with them from Africa to America as slaves. Ashari Akita and Maliki and Fik, and they adhered to Tasawwuf. You know, you shouldn't let that just skate by you. You shouldn't let that float over your head. Well, alhamdulillah. Continue. I'm sorry. Bismillah. It was with the encouragement of Baba Ahmed Kenya that I decided to expand my earlier work. This founder of the Islamic Heritage Month in Philadelphia, historic dramatic performance artist, jazz musician, an illustrator, creator of living history, dramatic plays on Omar Ibn Said, Yero Mahmoud, and Bilali Muhammad. Baba Kenya did the cover for my work on Bilali Muhammad. This volume includes the obituary of Omar, his autobiography, 21 pages of his other writings, and his 40 plus lines of annotations in his Arabic Bible. The translations come with facil facilities, facsimile. facil facsimiles of the original text, transliteration of many of the lines, and a discussion of co content and background of each text. Additionally, there is an analysis of the content of his texts, a survey of writings and scholarly dis the studies on Omar, and a discussion of texts he and other Muslims held in bondage in North America studies. The work of the free soiler and educational theorist, Theodore Dwight is important in understanding Omar's background. Dwight had collected texts from Muslim authors in Liberia, Panama, and the United States and wrote several articles about them and their authors. He was personally responsible for Omar writing his autobiography and it eventually being translated and his original articles are included herein. An interview of Imam Adam Bayer of Mashid Omar Ibn Said in Fayetteville, North Carolina, a remembrance of Derek Beard and a list of items in Beard's collection related to Omar Ibn Said are also included in the study of Omar Ibn Said's life and writings. Tamira, did you ever pray in that, in that masjid? No. Drove by, but I never prayed in it. I pray, I think I prayed one Juma in that masjid, right? Yeah. Uh. Bismillah. Inshallah, this work will encourage the search for other early American Muslim texts and the writing of further histories and biographies. Dr. Muhammad A. Al-Hari, 
Magrabines Press, Chicago, Shawa, the first of Shawal, 1442, May 13, 2021. Bismillah, let's go. The life of Umar ibn Said ibn Adam. Omar ibn Said was born around the year 1770 between the banks of the two main rivers in Fusatorum, Futur, on an area in the modern day Senegal and Gambia region of Africa. Stop right there. Said he was born around the year 1770. What year was the Shehu born? Anybody can answer. What year was the Shehu born? According to the Gregorian calendar. While I'm waiting for an answer, Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 1754. Imad, Rahim, Rashi, Adil, Nazim, Isa, Nadir, Yahya, and Sabir. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, all of you. 1754. What'd you say? 1754. 1754. What year was uh, the Declaration of Independence in America? Uh, 1776. Yes. I'm asking you all these questions so you can so you can uh, have your timeline, you know, so I can give you all some context. Shehu, 1754, he was born. He was born. Umar ibn Said was born around 1770. And America declared their independence from Britain in 1776. Okay. And so Umar ibn Said is from Fututoro, modern day Senegal, Gambia. You know, they call that area Senegambia. You hear that terminology a lot as well. Uh, and Aisha, Walek Salara to the record. Continue. Do you want me to read the footnote or no? No, you can keep going. Okay. Bismillah. His father had more than one wife. The elder Said had six sons and five daughters. Three sons and one daughter were from Omar's mother. Umar's father was a man of considerable wealth who was able to live off the proceeds of the work of his 70 slaves. We can Omar, read that for a note. Okay. In reviewing the text, Baba Kenya made the following pertinent comment. I question the authenticity of the statement considering the 1790 edict of El Mami Abdul Qadir Khan and letter to the French prohibiting slave trade in Futatoro in response to French kidnapping of Fulani children as evidenced by Sylvian Dio in her book, Servants of Allah. I think this is actually more in line with Omar's writing autobiography than an allegation that his father had 70 slaves. Okay, continue. <clears throat> and Abdul Qadir Khan, he's a very important person. Uh, Dr. Bilal Weir speaks a lot about him because he preceded uh, all of the Europeans and others in outline and outlawing as a ruler, outlawing uh, slavery, you know, as a Muslim. He, he, out, he, he beat all the other, you know, so-called enlightened Europeans who decided uh, when it was convenient for them to outlaw slavery. Go ahead, continue. Omar's father was killed in tribal warfare when Omar was five years old. The whole family has been removed to live in an uncle's residence. While living with his uncle, Omar was trained to be a basic elementary school teacher. At school, he taught children the Arabic alphabet, how to pray, short surahs of the Quran, and some arithmetic. After many years as a teacher, Omar became a trader. The chief articles of the mercantile trade he engaged in were salt, cotton, clothing, and textiles. According to, a, according to some accounts, Omar left a wife and child in Africa, but their names are never given. While trading 
to be a teacher, Omar was initiated into the Qadriya Tariqa. And this led some of his visitors when he was enslaved to label him a Freemason. Qadr, all the Qadriyas in the building stand up. <laughs> Remember how earlier we was talking about uh, the Islam that was taken away from many of our ancestors uh, who were kidnapped and brought here and enslaved, you're going to find something consistent. They were Ashari in Creed, Maliki in Methab, and a lot of them were Qadriya and Tariqa. And you're not going to find, especially those, because you got to remember, the Europeans at some point uh they would they would outlaw slavery in stages like in america they slavery wasn't outlawed right away but they outlawed the, the importation of slaves before that so you know if you know the history of the tijani tarika which is more numerous and more popular now you know the uh that Torika was spread and made very popular, like in the middle towards the latter of latter part of the slave trade. So you're not going to find a lot of slaves that made it to America to be uh, Tijani because the Torika either what didn't exist yet or was just starting. So that's very important to understand. Before the Tijanis became extremely popular and and numerous in Africa, it was the Qadiriya who was uh, numerous and popular in the African continent. Continue. Bismillah. In the year 1807, while in a trading party on the coast of West Africa, he was captured and sold into slavery at the age of 37. Omar also had gone to Hajj and fought in Jihad before being sold into slavery by Portuguese slavers. Omar was brought to America. Read that footnote. Footnote number seven. Autobi autobiography, 1925 translation. Also for why he refused to return to his country, see John L. Wilson, Western African Africa, its history, condition, and prospects. 1864. Omar was expelled from his country for crime. The crimes for exile included murder, adultery, and witchcraft. See pages 81 and 353. Omar was brought Omar was brought to America from the coast in a slave galley ship with only two other captured slaves aboard being able to speak his language. The first person who purchased Omar was a pious man who treated him decently but died soon afterwards. In the year 1808, a rice planter from Charleston, South Carolina named Johnson purchased a group of slaves. Among these slaves was Omar Ibn Said. He proved to be too slight a bill for the work on the plantation and was thus considered a little of little value. At length, he strolled off the plantation and after many we weeks of walking, reached Fayetteville, North Carolina. There he was put in a local jail for runaways. No one claimed him. The doors were open, but he made no attempt to escape. Finding coal on the fo floor of the jail, he rubbed it against the walls, ride it, Writings in Arabic, please for help. No one could read them, nor the epistles he knelt to pine trees near the jail. Omar proved to be of a good nature, with a sense of humor, and made friends easily. Local boys amused themselves by visiting him and decided to make a makeshift desk for the jail's sole occupant. On this desk, he wrote epistles in a language that later proved to be Arabic, calling for belief in Allah destiny, a stolen patience in the times of adversity. At first, Omar did not know any English and thus was unable to tell his jailer who he was or whence he came. Omar drew attention of prominent men of the community, 
but his Charleston owner did not come for him. Eventually, the jailer, the local sheriff, Mr. Mumford, brought the news of Omar to the attention of a local politician named James Owen, whose brother, John Owen, later became governor of North Carolina, 1828 to 1830. John Owen died in 1841 after serving as president of the National Democratic Convention at <clears throat> Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Mumford passed the news on to James and John Owen by telling the River Ferry captain to mention Omar to General Owen during his weekly trip between Wilmington and Fayetteville to Owens Hill. Mumford was tired of such a useless charge and eagerly sold him for his, for his jail dues to General Owen. At General Owen's plantation on Cape Fair River, Owens Hill, Omar became a favorite household servant learned English and was given over charge of the keys to his master's stores, new master's stores. Omar was also given his own cottage, a carriage, and a servant of his own. For a short while, Omar, Omar's front, former master, Johnson, and an unnamed, na unnamed man, Johnson, sold Omar to try to take charge of Omar, but Owens claimed hell. Cape Fear was the county seat. It was between Wilmington, Fayetteville, Dublin, and Tar Hill in Bladen County. It was famed for his magnolias and pine trees. This new master, James Owen, was a pious Christian and instructed him in the Gospels. At first, Umar practiced Islam openly, even fasting during Ramadan. After some time at having learned English, Omar felt it expedient to give allegiance to Christianity in public and practice his own faith in private due to the good care he received from General James Owen. Read footnote number 15. African Muslims in Antebellum, America, page 135, paragraph 1 states, Umar repeatedly maintained his, re his required fast and dietary rules for some time, and he seemed not to have tried to master the language of the New World. One visitor thought he had never heard such bad broken English. Continue. <clears throat> Several years after his arrival at Owens Hill, Omar joined the local Presbyterian church and was baptized by Reverend Dr. Snodgrass. Later, he transferred his membership to the First Pres Presbyterian Church of Wilmington, North Carolina. Omar proved useful at church due to his knowledge of Arabic and Hebrew. <laughs> Omar always wore a trench coat and a skull cap to church and was given an honored seat in the winter by the stove and in the front rows in, in the summer. The Owen family cared for so much for Omar that, he, that they offered him freedom several times, had him eat meals with them, and made sure a family member always looked out for his interests. Thomas Owen took ownership of Omar after the deaths of John and James Owen. Eventually, Omar received a Bible in Arabic, which he treasured and made covers for. He discarded each cover when it, tore, when it wore out and made another. This Bible was presented to North Carolina's Davidson College at his death, where it still resides. Many of his Arabic writings later proved to be either the 23rd Psalms or the Lord's Prayer, all prefaced by praises for the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It must be noted here that none of his Arabic writings ever portrayed a clear cut with his Islamic faith. Over his years with the Owen family, Omar had many visitors. Among those that visited him were politicians, ethnologists, and missionaries. He met Jonas King, a missionary, Theodore Dwight Jr., who took his autobiography to Laman Kebe, John Frederick Ford, a North Carolinian supporter of repatriation of former slaves, William Brown Hodgson, a Savannah ethnologist, and others. He talked little to any of them until he was able to know their motives. He gave Francis Scott Key a two-page epistle in 1819. Ford, a copy of the 23rd Psalms on November 11, 1855 and copies of various passages from the Bible and Quran to visitors on other occasions. 
The gifts to Theodore Dwight eventually led to a campaign to send Arabic Bibles to Africa. Omar never returned to his native land. He died in North Carolina in 1859, a pious Muslim to the end, professing Christianity in public only to ease his life under the institution of slavery. A Christian Read that footnote number 19. There had been a consistent question about whether Omar Ibn Said was buried. The inscription where, where Omar Ibn Said was buried. Where Omar Ibn Said was buried. The inscription on his stone was Omero, a slave. The stone was later removed and disappeared. He was buried beside Colonel Thomas Owen, just outside the bricked in section of a family plot of Owen Hill. C. Campbell. Omaro, a slave, for details on the on the tombstone. This reference was found in Paramore, Thomasy Muslim Slaves Aristocrats in North Carolina. The North Carolina Historical Review, April 2000, page 127 to 150. Um, <clears throat> A Christian missionary named Mr. Bliss was shown some of the some of Omar's Arabic writings, and those writings later became the impetus for campaign to send Arabic Bibles to the interior of Africa, where Arabic was read by Muslims, even if their native tongues were still not written. That's what a lot of people don't understand. Until the colonial period, Africa. I mean, Arabic was one of the main language, was like the one of the languages that you can go from region to region and without necessarily knowing any of the local languages. But if you knew Arabic, you can communicate with someone. A lot of people don't understand that. Even to this day, right? In, uh, in Africa, it's very easy to learn Arabic. Even, you know, out after the colonial languages and the local languages, the Muslims there always make it easy to learn Arabic. And they have Arabic schools all over the place. Uh, go ahead. And, and up until the colonial period, the local languages in most of the African regions was written using the Arabic script. They call it Ajami. When you write another language using Arabic. So that's very important as well. Continue. Bismillah. In 1825, Omar wrote an autobiography in Arabic. About 25 pages in length, it begins with four pages from the Quran, Surah 67, and then has several blank folios before the main text where Omar describes his early life, his capture, and his experiences as a slave. The chapter that begins the autobiography was also in a letter to Francis Scott Key, author of the Star Spangled Banner, and is presented in Austin's text with commentary and translation from Arabic. The Arabic original of, his, of this autobiography was lost since it was the first published translation in 1925. The Jameson translation is actually a slight revision of the earlier one by Alexander, Alexander Corbeil of the American Ethnological Society done in 1848. Like many scholars, Jameson used Corbeil, Corbeil work and called it his own. The Corbeil translation, the original Arabic text, and a dozen of other documents related to Theodore Dwight Jr. were recently rediscovered and are now owned by Joshua Rabah, an African-American dealer in rare books and collectibles dealing with African-Americans. I had the opportunity to get a photocopy of the autobiography and read from the original manuscript when Joshua visited my home in 1996. His Arabic writings were seen by at least two other Muslims during his lifetime. His autobiography was seen by Lemon Kebe, see below. His autobiography, I mean, and an epistle was sent to Omar ibn Said by a Muslim from Canton, 
named Yang, who received one of Omar's Arabic writing through Reverend D. Ball, a missionary to China. The end of Yang's reply reads, The true Lord, the most worthy, have compassion on my respected senior, Moreau, whose letter was come, has come to hand. It is fully understood, but he and I are separated so many thousand miles from each other that we are not able to meet each other and speak face to face, but we may hope for the returning favors of the true Lord. This will be most fortunate, most fortunate. Beyond the few scraps of Arabic, half mythic, mythical remember, remembrances and two photos of Omar, little remains to remember the strong-hearted Fulani Muslim. And the Muslim. Put a pin in that. He was a Fulani Muslim who, in Gambia, they call him Fula. So he's a, in Gambia, uh, the Fulanis are the second largest ethnic group after the Man Mandinkas. Go ahead. Bismillah. The Muslims of Fayetteville sought to change the situation and built a masjid named after him in the 1980s. The original building was torn down for, for a highway expansion, but a new building was dedicated in 1996. Perhaps in the future, others will step forward to name Islamic centers, highways, and schools after such Islamic pioneers in the Americas. When Omar passed from this life, there was enough interest in him, life, in his life for the obituary to be published by the North, North Carolina Presbyterian. This was reprinted in several other newspapers. The one below is from the Raleigh, North Carolina Weekly Standard. The North Carolina Presbyterian mentions the death of a very remarkable Negro known as Uncle Maru and belonging to General Owen of Wilmington. He was, according to his own account, 93 years of age. We quote the following. He was born in Western Africa upon the banks of the Senegal River. His name originally was Omar, Omero, which he gradually been changed into the French title he now bears. He belonged to the tribe of the Fulas, but from which of the various nations inhabited by this people he came, it is difficult to ascertain. There is no doubt, however, that he is the most remarkable of his tribe ever brought to this country and is now perhaps the one, the only one of the nation now living in the United States. One of the same was sent back to Africa as early as 1733 by Oglethorpe. Another was ransomed and sent to Liberia in 1833. Besides, these not more than two fullers were known in 1855 to be in the limits of the South southern states. I don't know. Uh, we know a whole lot more than that. The Lali Muhammad that was mentioned earlier, uh, Yaru Mahmoud, uh, others are escaping me. Uh, Prince Abdurrahman, Amir Abdurrahman, all of them were Fulani. Well, go ahead. Uncle Moreau was brought to this country in 1807, just before the final abolition of the slave trade. He, he Once was, again, this is important. Uh, pay, learn to listen critically, right? Say so just before the abolition of the slave trade, meaning the importation of slaves. We know that slavery or that well, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, quote unquote, in 1865 something like that right so you have to remember you know they make a distinction between the absolute abol abolition of slavery and the importation of slaves you have to keep that in mind go ahead bismillah he was landed at charleston sometime after he reached this country he fell into the hands of a cruel master from whom he escaped after being arrested as a runaway and confined in jail in Fayetteville, he was at length purchased by General Owen, to whom he belonged at the time of his death. When Uncle Moreau became the property of General Owen, he was a very devout Mohammedan, but, but was soon taught a more excellent way. He was baptized by the Reverend Dr. Snodgrass, 
then pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville and became a member of that church. His membership- It's a good thing that we're reading this book because depending on who you listen to or who you read, some people say that he apostated and he became Christian and other people say no. And so it's a good thing that uh, the author and compiler of this book is getting to the bottom of that. He, you know, he, he zooms in, you know, on that issue. So we shall soon find out, inshallah. Go ahead. Bismillah. His membership was afterwards transferred to the first church, Wilmington, of which he died a com communicant. His piety was of the highest order, being characterized by a childlike trust in the Savior that perhaps never was excelled. He spent several months of last year in Fayetteville, a refugee from his home, and during the time, though exceedingly feeble, feeble in bodily health, he was rarely absent from the house of God during worship. Calling to see him on one occasion, calling to see him on one occasion, we found him reading his Arabic Bible, which was his constant companion, and he gave us a specimen of his composition in Arabic which though not equal in beauty to others we have seen written early in his life, does, does credit to his penmanship of that ancient language. But the devout, humble Christian reclaimed from the darkness of heathenism has passed to the immediate presence of his Savior. And heathenism the they're referring to is, is Islam, what they're calling mm -hmm. heathenism. Go ahead. And in the judgment of these who knew him best, there are a few of those now enjoying his blessed privilege who have undergone less change at their transition from earth to heaven than Uncle Moreau. This is, we're going to stop here. This is extremely important. This is why I always say that in my mind and in my opinion, and I'm not a scholar or anything like that, but in my opinion, the slave trade from one perspective was just another extinction or and an expansion of the crusades uh even if you go back to uh the portuguese and there uh i forgot the uh the pope or the cardinal's name of portugal but he made uh what the equivalent of an islamic fatwa saying that they should go and capture and enslave all quote unquote Muslims. He didn't say Muslim, but Muslims and pagans, African Muslims and pagans. And the, it always starts with the Portuguese because the per Portuguese, they were the first to actually go in and try to invade and try to capture slaves in Africa. If you know the history between the Portuguese and the Moroccans and the fall of the Songhai Empire, and then uh, that's why all of these places, even Gambia and Senegal, right? Before the British and the French were there, it was the Portuguese. So uh, they they made it like a, a religious, uh, a, a good religious deed for you to go in, capture and enslave Muslims and try to forcibly convert them to Christianity. And so the, the slave trade in and of itself, right, had its start on top of being a commercial endeavor, it had religious motivation behind it. Uh, and I don't have the quote with me right now, but if you all remember that were with us on the tour, I mentioned it when we were at G Gory Island. You know, this, this thing had religious motivation behind it. So it was the, the church, the the Catholic Church, that was the, the engine, the motivation, the push behind the Europeans to enslave Africans because they were seen as heathens, meaning Muslims. They were seen as like uh, like pagans. They considered Muslims and pagans all the same thing. And so they wanted to go and force them to see the light of Christ, so to speak. So alhamdulillah, we're going to stop there. Are there any more, uh, are there any questions? The book looks thick, but it's not actually that long because a lot of it is pictures of his writing. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Safiya.
do you have any comments, Amira? No, not at this time. The Umar Saeed is very important. He was very connected. I'll wait a few more seconds to see if anyone has any comments, questions. This history is important for us to learn. When people start talking about the first Muslims here and all this kind of stuff. Oh, I did want to mention something. Uh -huh. um, in a interview with uh, Brother Mustafa Briggs and his Beyond the Loud, based on his book, Beyond the Loud book, with Imam um, Dawood Wali, he had mentioned about the language of the Africans and how they were um how that language was like what's the word I want to say it dominated their own language like there was very um they were masters of the Arabic language so we need to ask ourselves how did it become that way you understand just like we hear in America our dominant language is what? English, right? Mm -hmm. And then in Africa, how did the dominant language um, in West Africa became Arabic? So that's something that uh, we need to research. And don't go by the research of those that are enemies to Allah, but do some real research to why that is the case. Um, it's, it's deeper than what it didn't be, it's deeper than what's on the surface. There are pictures. Yes, this is the more famous picture of Umar ibn Saeed right here. Mm -hmm. Many of y'all probably seen this picture. The um, match that they mentioned. There's another picture of Umar ibn Saeed right here, but a different head cover. This picture is a little bit less famous. What were you going to say? Nothing. You cut me off. No, you cut me off. I was going to mention, you had asked me, did I make Salat in the masjid? That masjid that you referred to was located off of Murchison Road. If you know anything about Fayetteville, North Carolina, you know, that's the base of Fort Bragg. And that master is like in the beginning part of Murchison Merch, Merch, Road um, on the right hand side going towards Fort Bragg. But I've never been to that. I've never been in it. I've always passed by it. Hell, oh, Fatima, I ain't listening to you, man. You want to take us out anyway. <laughs> You're biased. Thank you, Gigi. No. All right, so alhamdulillah, there's no questions. Inshallah, we'll get back to it tomorrow, inshallah. If you want to purchase your copy of the text, we put, we put the link up there earlier. Make sure you get it. It's very important. Alhamdulillah. So with that, we'll close out. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this knowledge beneficial to us all and that we uh, not only benefit by it but we be we benefit others by it subhanakallah huma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik wa la asr illa al-insana la fi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawassaw bil haqqi wa tawassaw bis sabr assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh
Peter, I have a 